All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to the December Rocky Mountain Railroad Club annual meeting. Um, we'll uh, get to our guest speaker, Scott Lotus, a little bit later in the presentation, but as this is our December meeting, uh, we have to do all of our usual uh, yearly club elections and, and business stuff first. So um, what I'm going to do is during the business part of the meeting, I will allow everyone to unmute themselves. So if you have something to say, uh, you can unmute yourself, speak up, and then if you'd go back unmute, that would be greatly appreciated for keeping the meeting uh, somewhat understandable for everyone. Um, we will have a couple of votes. Um, we've talked about how to do that exactly. Um, one option is through the chat box to say that you are voting for or against, just yay or nay on a given item. Uh, you can also just use the, the reaction thumbs up if you want to say that you vote yes on something. Unfortunately, there's no good icon for voting against something. Um, however, given that this is uh, more or less a yearly formality, and it's been a long time since I've heard somebody vote against something, you might want to just put it in the chat so we can make sure that your vote is counted. Um, let's see. Uh, at that, I'm going to open it up so you can unmute yourselves. And Denny, Dave, uh, would you like to take over? Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the December Rocky Mountain Railroad Club meeting and uh, Merry Christmas to everybody. It's hard to believe that uh, another December's here and what's truly been a wacky year from any uh, number of uh, points. So it's good to have everybody online, and, uh, and we've got a great, uh, great show coming up. Uh, again, I have to thank Nathan for coordinating the technicality of this meeting. So, um, anyway, thanks a lot. Um, I look forward to uh, um, elections like everybody else does, <laughs> and uh, in this case. Um, um, the um, a couple of things in, in terms of the uh, annual meeting, which we really kind of need to call to order. Um, the uh, treasurer's report, we, we kind of did a treasurer's report a little bit earlier in the year, and we'll do another one later in the 21 to keep everybody kind of informed, but the club's in, uh, in pretty solid position at the moment. Um, we do have minutes from last year, um, and... Um, so I don't, um, they were published in the uh, Rocky Mountain Rail Report. Um, is, there a, is there a motion on those minutes? I so move to accept the meeting minutes as they were published. Okay. Could I have a second on that? I'll second that. Um, so I guess we'll try this either through some eyes or a bunch of clap hands or something. See how we can make this work. We can turn the vote on, I think. We, maybe if you need. There is a raise hand yeah. option on mine, at least. Yeah. And I guess I could ask, are there any, um, and everybody could unmute, is there any uh, opposition to that motion? And, and hearing that, then we'll declare the annual meetings from last year accepted. And, and uh, they were published in the, in the um, December issue and everything. So um, uh, the next thing that we have to do on our annual meeting is to elect four officers and three board members for the uh, Rocky Mountain Railroad Club. And uh, concurrently, they serve as president, uh, vice president, secretary and treasurer and board of directors also for the historical foundation, the Rocky Mountain Railroad 
Club Historical Foundation. Um, so um, at this point, are there any nominations for any of those offices from the floor? Um, I haven't heard or seen any, so uh, we'll close the um, close the uh, nomination, I guess. And um, so, uh, without objection, we'll go to um, voting for the four officers, and their names were published. I guess I should have uh, announced that, but uh, uh, Benny Leonard for president, and Dave Sharp for vice president, uh, Andy. Um, Dell for secretary and Keith Jensen uh, for um, uh, treasurer, and then the, uh, the the directors would be uh, that we would be electing would be Nathan Holmes, Debbie McDonald, and Pat Morrow. Um, so, all in favor of those nominated? Aye. 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 Oh, there we go. Um, is there opposition to any uh, of those? Okay, seeing none, we'll declare that the election's been held and uh, we'll certify <laughs> those uh, seven people to um, be on our leadership for uh, 2021. And, Hopefully we look forward to being able to shake a few hands along the way besides uh, these wonderful video meetings. So uh, with that dispensed, I'm going to close the annual meeting per se. Um, and um, our, uh, our video meeting we've got going, I'm going to turn over to Dave for some announcements on programs and other things that he knows. All right. Thanks, Denny. And uh, <clears throat> happy December, everybody. I had to turn my camera off because I have some sort of an issue where I can use the mic or use the camera, but not both. So now you don't have to look at me. So uh, yeah, quick, uh, quick announcement for next month. We will have uh, at the January meeting, our program will be from Steve Barry, um, some Pennsylvania uh, shots that he's going to show us of uh, uh, Great Western number 90 running uh, recently and also some uh, more recent stuff from the East Broadtop. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the East Broadtop seems to be on the rebound and coming back. They're hoping to have some, some good operating next year in 2021. And then our February program will be from uh, Stephen Peck, who's been in a lot of different uh, railroad uh, uh, occupations over the years. He's worked at the Georgetown Loop. He's worked at the Durango and Silverton. He's been with the San Luis and Rio Grande down out of Alamosa. He worked at Colorado Rail Car, and uh, lately he's been working on some some stuff with uh, commuter rail in California, and he may even be involved in something uh, between LA and Vegas. We'll let him tell us about that. Um, some other quick updates. Of, uh, when we have normal meetings where we get to meet in person, we, we let people stand up and make announcements and tell us what they know of uh, upcoming rail news. Uh, I'll try to touch on a few things. Uh, I know that the, uh, the former Missouri Pacific line that went east of Pueblo out into Kansas has uh, kind of sat in disrepair for a long time. It's been getting upgraded and they just in the last week or two have uh, reinstalled a switch uh, at a place called NA Junction, which is east of Pueblo, east of the small town of Boone, Colorado. Um, I believe Watco will run the, run the line uh, for a company called Colorado Pacific on that old uh, Missouri Pacific line and, uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe has uh, agreed that if they will build roughly 110 car unit trains of grain, that then they will pick them up and take them via BNSF. I think they don't really want to mess with anything smaller than that. But uh, so that's happening. And uh, there's some photos that I saw even just this evening of a locomotive that seems to be painted up WAMX unit that's painted blue and has a Colorado flag symbol and uh, some lettering that says Colorado Pacific. So we may see that thing wander west of Wichita here one of these days, but but not yet. Uh, Coombers and Toltec Scenic Railroad, uh, their general manager, Don, John Bush, recently retired after about eight years. Um, he's, he's put in a lot of 
time down there and we congratulate him on a good job and thank him for his service. And I think he, he and his wife are going to stick around Chama and run a bed and breakfast, as I understand it. Um, uh, speaking of BNSF again, uh, Catherine Farmer, who is currently one of their executives, has been with them for a long time. She will become CEO at the first of the year. So that will be, as far as I know, the first uh, class one railroad with a, a woman in charge. That's cool. And uh, it was recently announced that the Rocky Mountaineer uh, luxury passenger trains that uh, have been running across Canada, they're going to try something between Denver and Moab starting next summer. So uh, you might do a search for that on the internet. Rocky Mountaineer is their, uh, their company name. I don't really know much about the details uh, or how they're going to handle passengers in Moab or if they get off someplace else and, and do bus part way, but uh, something's in the works. So that would be an interesting piece of uh, passenger rail out West. Dave, so, if I may, it's on their webpage, uh, yeah. including an initial reservation. Okay. And, and uh, cool. I think it wasn't cheap, right, Wally? But, uh, you know, might be fun. No, it's not. But uh, they're, they're going to go to Moab over the branch line off the Union Pacific Main. And they're working with uh, hotels and others, uh, both in Grand Junction and the Moab area, to put together a, a, a real tourism package. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. And they still have a few months to work that out. So, yeah, thanks for that, Wally. And uh, I think I'm about done with announcements. If, uh, if it's okay with everybody else, we can move on to the Center for Railroad Photography and Art. in uh, Scott Dave, Lewis. I missed oh, it. Uh-oh. Go ahead. There's a couple other things. Denny uh, first, and then Pat had an update. Denny had, an, or Pat had an update for us on Como, too. Okay, oh, Pat. good. Uh, Mike Tanetti sent me a note, and I don't have it in front of him. Mike, you're on this. I think that would be a good announcement to make. Can you unmute and make that announcement about the Chama? Uh, oh, yeah. For those who don't know, a club member... Uh, of many years uh, uh, is the owner of the Rio Chama RV park that probably everybody knows in Chama and it's for sale for anybody who wants to buy it. So. Uh, had to get that one made. Somebody might have a great retirement business down there. <laughs> I think that's what he had, but yeah, he's moved to California now. Okay. All right, oh, thanks. I didn't want to miss that. I thought that was important. So anyway, back to you, uh, Nathan. Or Pat. Okay. Yes. Uh, so we loaded up two uh, loads of railroad ties just east of Longmont uh, two weeks ago. So we got those coming up to Como. What we size load? Up. What's that? What size load? Like semi-truck? Yeah, semi-truck. Two semi-truck okay. loads. Yeah. Disher's bringing them up. We keep him busy, you know. Um, <laughs> and then um, we got that other box car in kind of towards the end, in fall there. I'm forgetting the number. Maybe you guys know. But, Is that uh, the one from Boris? No, that was 8311. That one, yeah, that came in June. But then we got a third one. So now we have the, uh, or what they call the type one, two, and three different box cars that the right and I, think, I think this one that came from over three. montrose or olatha maybe yeah. yeah i think it was over or i think it was over by maybe the De, dolores oh no no it was by olatha yeah it came from and, and for those people that didn't didn't catch what pat's telling us this is all uh related to como colorado the old uh colorado and southern uh area and uh there's been a lot of uh, rebuilding going on up there of, of yard tracks and uh, things happening around the roundhouse and the hotel for, for the yeah, look people behind people me. Know that. Yeah. <laughs> there you yeah, go. Any, yeah. Any picture. Yeah. We're I, yeah. In, the number. And, and on that picture. Yeah. That kind of gives us, a, you know, I think Bob hit that in August, but now we are clear up to the end of the field, the track there where you can see in Denny's picture, it's only just right past the hotel. And we have a flat car sitting up there at the end of the property. That's, Pretty much the end of the property line there for the for now. We're we'll see about continuing on there, but uh, we're so we got that box car also. Um, plans are moving forward to rebuild the water tank. 
Uh, we've had a private donor and some other working on grants and everything to rebuild the water tank. So, um, you know, we've got a, the engineering firms working on that. Um, so I think that's most of the latest updates. So and they had uh, just um, posted the work days for 2021 also on southparkrail.com and also dspnphs.org. And um, one thing I want to point out to everybody is, you know, yeah, we, we have the volunteer track days to work on track, but there's also other, uh, we're, as we start expanding, you know, we're getting a little group together now working on car bodies. They're working on the, uh, the uh, gondola now. And uh, so, you know, and Lord knows we've got plenty of uh, that to work on. So, um, you know, it, it doesn't mean you're out there and heck, we got an auto automatic spiker now too. So it's not as uh, backbreaking as it was when we started with manually. But uh, anyway, just keep that in mind. If you, you know, um, there's other uh, volunteer opportunities besides just uh, pounding and laying rail. So I think that covers it. Thanks. If All right, I may, thanks, Pat. Okay. I've got one announcement and one request. Uh, the announcement is the CNS coach in um, Idaho Springs, if I was told correctly, went up yesterday with Hulcher or with the, uh, uh, Oh, what's his, the regular trucker? And it's going to be restored by the folks at uh, in Silver Plume. Uh, Mark uh, and the rest of the, the uh, Georgetown Loop guys are going to restore the car. They've got a contract with Idaho Springs. And my guess is that knowing the guys up there, they'll test it once or twice before they give it back to uh, hey. Idaho Springs. Or, th 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 or three or four. But that it is uh, supposedly Disher took it yesterday. And they're w going to put a cover over that when it's done, similar to what there's down in uh, uh, Gunnison or down in that area where they, they want to cover it up because they just feel it's, it's getting too much exposure to the weather. And there are some water leaks, but uh, Mark Grable and his team are going to restore the car for him. The other uh, is I, uh, just a request, as you know, or some of you, that I am your news webmaster if you're out and about and get a picture you'd like to share with the club my email address is on the club's news page send it to me and i will see that it gets posted uh, we get some great pictures from some of our members but i know other guys are out there and so keep it in mind right right uh hey wally well we've got you is there any update on the uh, trolley car 04 for the city of arvada yeah as a matter of fact we had a meeting today and uh, all of the seats have been reinstalled. They are the original rattan with the necessary seat frames. We don't have the brass handles, but they're all in place. Uh, doors and windows are in place. The partition for the motorman's compartment is in place. Uh, we're sourcing some parts for the underframe. Uh, they don't have. They won't work, but they'll look like air tanks and compressors. And and we're working on the uh, motorman's controller. I'm going to contact IRM about some parts. They already have the backup controller. They have found a Golden Glow style headlight wow. for the car. And that will be fabricated and put in place. One of the gentlemen uh, who is very active with us, his father was the Central Division Car House Superintendent, and he has graciously offered us the mirror that came off the 04 that his father removed and signed after the car arrived at the interurban loop. So that we got some artifacts coming. Um, he's going to supply the dimensions for the sign box and uh, we'll get gears and a, and a roller sign for the uh, number box. So yes, significant progress is being made. It almost looks like a real trolley. They have to canvas the roof, but they're working in Cheyenne and they have to wait for the weather. You have to, uh, soak the canvas and then uh, stretch it. And of course, right now it would freeze before it stretched. But yes, thank you, Dave. Yeah, it's really, really looking good. We're going to be putting together a five minute video to show the progress. And I will make sure that everybody at the club knows and it will be posted on the 04 website. Well, that, yeah, that'd be great. And, and, and I'm guessing that we probably will see that come to Arvada maybe next year, 2021. Yeah, that...
Dave, is to bring it down here. Uh, the site has tentatively been chosen, uh, and uh, they think they'll be done with the car by late summer. Uh, painting and other things are weather dependent, but uh, it really looks like a street car again. By the way, when they were dismantling it for repair, they found a door post that had the original number 11 painted hmm. on it. So we know it was car 11. And they've uncovered all of the 04.04 uh, signs on the car through careful removal of paint. So they're doing an extremely thorough and uh, historically correct restoration. Okay. Now, if uh, if nobody else has any announcements, I, I I was in such a hurry to introduce Scott that uh, you know I kind of blew everybody else off. Sorry about that. Uh, and please remember to uh, remute yourself. I see. Uh, Jim Eust is out there uh, watching. Uh, it looks like your mic might be on, and uh, I will shut mine off in a minute. And uh, uh, Scott, I guess I will let you give a little background on yourself. I, I mentioned. Uh, the, uh, should we vote to or get a motion to close out the meeting first? Oh, I thought we were way beyond that. All right, Denny, uh, I better let you do that. Yeah, I don't know that we did a formal motion on that. Could I have a motion to close the annual meeting? I so move to close the annual meeting. And a second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The annual uh, 2020 meeting Aye. is closed and uh, on to our presenter. Take it away, Scott. All right. Well, thank you, Dave. And, and thanks, everyone, for uh, the opportunity to speak with you tonight. I uh, really appreciate uh, the chance to share some uh, representations of railroading and uh, talk about railroad art. Uh, I will have my chat window open. So if anyone has questions, or if you're having trouble hearing me or anything else like that, uh, feel free to, to pop in while I'm talking here. Um, this show runs about 55 minutes in total. I know that might be a little bit longer than some of your presentations. It's about 35 or 40 minutes about art at the beginning and then about 15 or 20 on photography at the end. And this might be a little bit more familiar with the photography side of things. So if you need to drop off, I totally understand. Uh, but uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. Let me make sure my screen share is going to behave. We tested this just a moment ago. And let's see here. All right, is that looking good to everybody out there? All right, I see some thumbs up, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, well, thanks again, Dave, for the invitation to speak tonight. Uh, I'm Scott Lotus, the president and executive director of the Center for Railroad Photography and Art. We're a nonprofit organization uh, based in Madison, Wisconsin, and our mission is to preserve and present significant images of railroading. We don't have a museum or a gallery space, and that's a model that has always served us well, but especially in this year. Uh, we partner with a lot of different groups all over the country, including the Colorado Railroad Museum, which is currently hosting our Ted Rose Traveling Exhibition. Uh, we host regional and national conferences. Uh, we publish books in a quarterly journal, and we maintain a growing archive that now houses more than half a million images. Like the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club, we've pivoted to online programming, and most of our events are free and open to anyone who would like to attend via WebEx. You can view all of our past presentations on our YouTube channel, and that's at youtube.com slash railphotoart, all one word, youtube.com slash railphotoart. Or you can check our website, railphoto-art.org, or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, for details about our upcoming programs. Our next one is a week from tomorrow, actually, December 16th, when Kevin Keefe and I will be presenting the photography of Wallace W. Abbey. Now, for a little bit about me, I grew up in West Virginia and Southeastern Ohio, where I watched coal trains and launched model rockets as a kid. And then I went to Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, where I studied mechanical engineering. If any of you have seen the movie October Sky, my childhood had at least a few parallels with Homer Hickam's, although mine occurred about 40 years later, and I was definitely into trains more than rockets. Either way, I think Jake Gyllenhaal was a great choice for the lead role. Now, last year, we celebrated milestones in both rocketry and railroading. Uh, the 50th anniversary of the first Apollo moon landing and the 150th anniversary of the completion of our first transcontinental railroad. Now, it's fitting that we marked both achievements at the same time. The Apollo project was the literal moonshot of the 20th century, 
And the first transcontinental railroad was every bit as much the moonshot of the 19th century. Science and technology made possible both of these moonshots. Art can help us understand them. I'd like to share a quote from a New York Times book reviewer who wrote the following about the Apollo program. The day of the first moonwalk, my father's college literature professor told his class, someday they'll send a poet and we'll find out what it's really like. Now that I think is what art aspires to. It helps us make sense of the world and better understand the impacts of all the amazing science and technology we create. Now we still haven't sent a poet to the moon, but railroads exist right here on terra firma and they've been inspiring poets and artists of all sorts from their very beginnings. Tonight I'm going to talk about railroads and art as well as a little bit more about photography. And to do that, we need to come back from the moon and go back to 1829, when the Sturbridge Lion, the first steam locomotive to operate in the United States, arrived in New York Harbor. And like a child's Christmas toy, it came with uh, some assembly required. But that took place outside, in the open air of the West Point Foundry Association, under the direction of a man named David Matthew. He wrote that the locomotive became the object of curiosity to thousands who visited the works from day to day. And now think of the otherworldly intrigue a New Yorker of the early 19th century would have felt upon seeing this 15,000 pound mass of metal being assembled and fired up for the first time. These early locomotives were the rock stars of their day, every bit as awe-inspiring as the Saturn V rockets would be 140 years later. 1829 predated the invention of commercially viable photography by a decade. So if we want to know what the scene would have looked like, we have to rely on artists. The print that I'm showing right now was made nearly 90 years after the fact, and it depicts the lion's first trial run on August 8th, 1829. I don't know how accurate it truly is, but the details look believable. And I think it captures something of the energy of that moment. And that's the aim of this painting. This is rain, steam, and speed, an 1844 masterpiece in oil, three feet by four feet, by the British artist J.M.W. Turner. We've crossed the pond now to England, cradle of the early railroads, and this is a scene from their Great Western Railway. Now the Great Western struck out from London to the west. It was built for speed, straight, flat, with a broad gauge of seven feet two feet wider, of course, than most of today's railroads, three feet wider or four feet wider than your narrow gauge lines in Colorado. The locomotive here is of a type called the Firefly, and these were absolute engineering marbles of their day. There were two two twos, and those two driving wheels, one on each side, stood seven feet tall. When they were introduced in 1840, they began pulling scheduled trains at average speeds of 50 miles per hour. And of course, average speeds include time for station stops, which means these trains regularly hit 60 and above. Now think about that. For all of human history up to that point, people could travel no faster than a horse could run. And then almost overnight, you could go a mile a minute. Journalists of the time struggled to write about this for they simply did not have the language to convey that kind of speed. But Turner gives us a sense for what it was like with this wonderfully impressionistic painting. Now, even today, almost two centuries later, steam locomotives can still draw crowds. This is the big boy when it came to Wisconsin last summer in July. On a Thursday morning, it made a brief stop in the little town of Friesland, Wisconsin, about an hour north of here, population 200. Well, well over a thousand people came out to see it. And of course, you might well wonder today if we even still need artists when everyone has high definition cameras on their cell phones. And now spoiler alert, I absolutely think we still need artists. And I also think it's worth noting that even though the allure of the steam locomotive persists, the emotions that they stir have changed. Their sense of wonder endures, but the 1829 excitement for the new has turned completely around to a nostalgic longing for what once was. In the railroad, we have the full arc of steam technology, and here we see the great pull of nostalgia. We'll come back to that. Now, first, though, I want to return to the mid-19th century 
and hear what a couple of our early writers had to say about the railroad. Ralph Waldo Emerson led the transcendentalist movement of the 19th century. He also provides us with one of the first literary considerations of the railroad in this journal entry. He writes, I hear the whistle of the locomotive in the woods. Wherever that music comes, it has its sequel. It is the voice of the civility of the 19th century saying, here I am. It is interrogative, it is prophetic, and this Cassandra is believed. Phew, 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 how is real estate here in the swamp and wilderness? Ho for Boston, phew, phew. I will plant a dozen houses on this pasture next moon and a village anon. Emerson writes with a driving force that echoes both the cadence of the locomotive and the impending changes it will bring to the land. Emerson's protege, Henry David Thoreau, is now considered to be the founder of the environmental movement in writing, thanks largely to his book called Walden. Thoreau lived at a log cabin on Walden Pond near Concord, Massachusetts from 1845 until 1847, right after the Fitchburg Railroad had completed its main line along the far side of the pond. And now you might expect Thoreau to build on his mentor and to lash out further against the encroaching railroad and its shrieking trains. Perhaps then you'll be as surprised as I was by what Thoreau had to say. He wrote, when I hear the iron horse make the hills echo with his snort like thunder, shaking the earth with his feet and breathing fire and smoke from his nostrils, it seems as if the earth had got a race now worthy to inhabit it. Thoreau was awed by this new technology. Yet while he did not criticize the railroad, he did criticize the intentions of its builders. And now, whether I agree with his criticisms or not, my lesson here is that as I study and even celebrate the railroad or any form of technology, I also need to step back from time to time and consider how it's being used. Emerson and Thoreau were among the first group of writers to develop a distinctly American voice. Our nation was still young, the British Empire was still large, and European notions of art and culture prevailed. Those notions set down clear ideas about what subject matter was acceptable for artists, and new technology was not on the list. The great painters of that age had been trained in figural, landscape, and genre work. The majority of the world's population still lived in the country, not in the city. Painting a product of industry like a factory or a locomotive was simply not something a proper artist would do. Yet as we've just seen, the railroad was such a force of nature that it practically demanded artistic consideration. As we begin to look at some of these early railroad paintings, keep in mind that the Western world was grappling with the sweeping changes of the Industrial Revolution, while artists were, gra were grappling with whether to even approach industrial subjects and then with how to actually go about painting them. So when the railroad does begin to appear in art, it first appears in the background. <clears throat> now this is the first of a few paintings that I'll be showing from Peter Moss, who serves on the center's board of directors and has a wonderful art collection. He wrote an extensive article about his collection for our journal, and I'll be drawing on his remarks for my presentation tonight. Well, this is a two foot by three foot oil painting by Arthur Fitzwillem Tate, and it shows the Dutton Viaduct on England's London to Birmingham line. It's very much in the style of the pictorial landscape paintings of the era, with the pastoral scene of cattle at the edge of the stream dominating the foreground. The viaduct is in the distance, and the train itself is tiny. But it's interesting to me that the railway, the new form of transportation, is bathed in sunlight, while barely visible at far right is the old way, the footpath where a woman in red and a child walk in deep shadow, almost as an afterthought. If we look at a famous example from American art, we see similar themes. This is Progress by Asher B. Durand, a six foot wide oil painting on the theme of manifest destiny. The train is even smaller here, crossing a low trestle way down there at right. You can just barely see the steam plume. But as with Tate's work, the railroad and all of the instruments of industrial progress are in sunlight, while a group of American Indians watches from the shadows at left. Durand was part of a group of painters known as the Hudson River School, the first distinctly American art movement founded by Thomas Cole. 
The Hudson River painters drew from Romanticism, but there are some key differences. The Romantics were reacting against the Industrial Revolution, and they tended to glorify the past. The Hudson River School was more embracing of change, and while they glorified the dramatic landscapes of New England, they also sought to reconcile the march of industrial progress. Their work strives for harmony between nature and technology. Within that vein, but also transcending it, is one of the most important railroad paintings of all time, the Lackawanna Valley by George Ennis. This was a commission by the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad. We often think of corporate art as containing propaganda, or at least clear biases. But today, the Lackawanna Valley stands as the most critically acclaimed railroad painting of the 19th century. We see many elements of the Hudson River School. There's warm light, pastoral landscape, a reclining figure in the foreground. But here the train is larger, more prominent, and the view includes much more of the railroad particularly the roundhouse, almost like a cathedral in the distance. The foreground is littered with stumps, looking more like a recent battlefield than a harmonious blending of nature and technology. Ian Kennedy, the former director of the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, wrote that Ennis could not conceal his unease at the price of material progress and the spoliation of nature by a new technological system. I'll be coming back to Kennedy's insights a few more times tonight. I have one more painting to show from this period, and it's my personal favorite, Jasper Francis Cropsey's Starucca Viaduct from 1865. Its namesake subject opened on the New York and Erie Railroad at Lanesboro, Pennsylvania in 1848. Now compared to the Lackawanna Valley, this painting presents a more typically harmonious view of the railroad and the landscape, but there are some key differences that make this work a standout. Most paintings from the Hudson River School are set in the spring, in the morning, signifying the dawning of a new age. Here it is autumn, and since this view looks south, the light coming in from the right shows that it's afternoon, with dark clouds rolling in from the west. They pretend not so much the beginning of something, but its end. Now let's investigate that notion by looking quickly at two more paintings by Thomas Cole. They comprise a narrative series, a popular motif of the 19th century. The first one, called The Departure, shows a great warrior confidently setting out from his castle, accompanied by his knights and attendants on horseback. It is springtime, in the morning, and spirits are high. This is the second painting, called The Return. Here it is autumn, the sun is setting, and attendants carry the ailing warrior to a church, while his steed follows behind with head down. The campaign did not go well. What was beginning in the previous painting is ending in this one. I see parallels in Cropsey's Starucca Viaduct. Multiple art critics have compared it to classical European paintings showing remnants of the Roman Empire. To me, Cropsey alludes to a preemptive nostalgia with the prescient implication that while the age of steam was currently rising, someday it would also fall. Nostalgia can be a funny thing, and I like to keep in mind that whatever we might wistfully long for today had once been new and modern. This is another painting from Peter Moss's collection called The Last of the Manchester Defiance. It's an 1864 copy by W.R.B. Shaw of an 1859 painting done by another artist. Peter provided a wonderful excerpt from the Illustrated London News of April 23rd, 1859, when the original painting first appeared. And I wanna share it with you. The author called this painting a striking illustration of the march of enterprise and civilization which distinguishes the present age. The old Manchester defiance, which was once the marvel of the traveling world has been put off the road by the superior powers of steam. And there the old wreck lies, horseless and wheelless with the door off its hinges, a place for fowls to rest in, in a dilapidated inn yard. And the inns themselves, where extortion and incivility was the rule, have long been shut up and deserted. The glass of ale or brandy and water with which the desperate outsider tried to console himself and infuse warmth into his drenched and chilled frame during the brief interval occasioned by the change of horses is now dispensed with 
and a man may arrive sober and comfortable and collected at the end of a 200 mile journey without having moved from his snug seat inside his first class carriage. But again, nostalgia is a funny thing. And 10 years later, Mark Twain would have nothing of the commentary found in the illustrated London news. Traveling by train through Europe in 1869, Twain had this to say in The Innocents Abroad. It is hard to make railroading pleasant in any country. It is too tedious. Stagecoaching is infinitely more delightful. Once I crossed the plains and deserts and mountains of the West in a stagecoach from the Missouri line to California. And since then, all of my pleasure trips must be measured to that rare holiday frolic. But again, nostalgia is fickle and minds can change. Just two years later, in 1871, Twain went west on our new transcontinental railroad, an event he chronicled in Roughing It, published in 1872. He wrote, at 4.20 p.m. Sunday, we rolled out of the station at Omaha and started westward on our long jaunt. A couple of hours out, dinner was announced, an event to those of us who had yet to experience what it is to eat in one of Pullman's hotels on wheels. So, stepping into the car next forward of our sleeping palace, we found ourselves in the dining car. It was a revelation to us, that first dinner on Sunday. And though we continued to dine for four days and had as many breakfasts and suppers, our whole party never ceased to admire the perfection of the arrangements and the marvelous results achieved. <clears throat> now this print is perhaps the best of the many that featured our first transcontinental railroad. The artist, Fanny Palmer, was an English immigrant, one of our best and most prolific printmakers. Courier and Ives published many of her prints, including this one, whose full title is Across the Continent, Westward the Course of Empire Takes Its Way. One hallmark of these views of the Transcontinental Railroad is how the tracks run invariably arrows straight across the land, a symbol of destiny and permanence. Also point out that in her print, the uh, Transcontinental Railroad is a double tracked route. I'm pretty sure it was single track in 1869. Palmer's work is layered with additional symbolic meaning. The tracks quite literally divide the industry of new civilization on the left with the untamed natural world on the right, where two American Indians on horseback watch helplessly as the smoke of the iron horse engulfs them. Railroads helped usher in the industrial age, regardless of whether the people impacted one of these changes or not. Artists portrayed this both subtly and overtly. Even more symbolic than Palmer's print is American Progress by John Gast from 1872. Here we have an allegorical female figure symbolizing the American nation, stringing telegraph wires and carrying the book of education as she floats westward with settlers, travel, travel, uh, traveling first on foot, then by covered wagon and stagecoach, and finally by train. They drive off American Indians, bison, and other wildlife. Even the weather patterns seem to be reversed as the light dawning in the east appears to be pushing off the clouds lingering over the mountains to the west. Now, if these last two images appear a bit heavy handed in their symbolism, remember that the Civil War had ended just a few years earlier. The nation was reunited, but that union was tenuous and hostilities festered, particularly in the south. These images spoke to renewal in a new union with a new economy defined not by north and south, and waterborne transport with animal power, but defined instead by east and west, iron roads and the power of steam. Now I should note that we were not alone in our use of allegorical female figures to illustrate our railways. This poster from 1900 portrays the Gotthard Railway in Switzerland as the unifier of Northern and Southern Europe. The figure stands on the winged wheel of the railways while our hands clutch the many lines of France, Belgium, and Germany. Zurich is right on top of her heart, while the many spiral tunnels and loops of the Gotthard line seem to form her intestines. Below them is the Lake District of Italy and the great industrial and financial city of Milan. Now, while we're in Europe, let's consider the work of French master Claude Monet, founder of Impressionism and widely acknowledged as one of the greatest painters of all time. Monet made several railway paintings in the 1870s, including a series inside a Paris train station 
1877. I have to share a brief aside from a brochure published by the Art Institute of Chicago about Monet's work that one of our members, Den Adler, recently brought to my attention. This brochure said, to convince the station master at the busiest train station in Paris to give him permission to paint in the station and train yard, Monet put on his best suit, fluffed out his ruffled cuffs, and carried a gold-tipped cane. Monet gave his card to the station master and announced that he wished to paint there. Not only did Monet get permission to paint, but the engineers ran the trains in and out of the stations as many times as Monet wanted. Now, it was this series of paintings that fully elevated the railroad to a subject worthy of the fine arts. Think about that for a moment. We've read several excerpts by great writers who discussed the railroad, and while trains show up frequently in literature, the great railroad novel that you might expect to find in 19th century American or British literature simply does not exist. It's much the same for these paintings we've been looking at. There are many that include the railroad, but usually as a small element, off in the distance. Yet when you stop to consider the, great co the greater context of 19th century art with its dictums of what was proper subject matter and what was not, the very fact that the railroad shows up as much as it does is nothing short of remarkable, and a testament to the railroad's great power and appeal. Monet was the tipping, the tipping point. He was the first significant painter, according to Ian Kennedy, to record the locomotive with any degree of physical presence. His station scenes from Paris brought the railroad fully into the realm of art. The overall impact was even greater. In part because of the railroad, everyday objects and common people finally started to become acceptable subjects for artists of all kinds. And while we did not get the great railway novel of the 19th century, Walt Whitman did give us a great railway poem to a locomotive in winter, which he wrote in 1876, the same time that Monet was making his railway paintings. Now, I think it's only fitting to show a few more Monets while, we, while reading Whitman's poem. V for my recitative. V in the driving storm, even as now, the snow, the winter day declining. V in thy panel plea, thy measured dual throbbing and thy beat convulsive thy black cylindric body, golden brass and silvery steel, thy ponderous sidebars, parallel and connecting rods, gyrating, shuttling at thy sides, thy metrical now swelling pant and roar, now tapering in the distance, thy great protruding headlight fixed in the front, thy long pale floating vapor pennants tinged with delicate purple, the dense and murky clouds out belching from thy smokestack, thy knitted frame, thy springs and valves, the tremulous twinkle of thy wheels. Thy train of cars behind, obedient, merrily following, through gale or calm, now swift, now slack, yet steadily careering, type of the modern, emblem of motion and power, pulse of the continent. For once come serve the muse and merge in verse, even as here I see thee, with storm and buffeting gusts of wind and falling snow, by day, thy warning ringing bell to sound its notes. By night, thy silent signal lamps to swing. Fierce-throated beauty, roll through my chant with all thy lawless music. Thy swinging lamps at night, thy piercing madly whistled laughter, thy echoes rumbling like an earthquake, rousing all. Law of thyself complete, thine own track firmly holding. No sweetness debonair of tearful harp or glib piano thine. Thy trills of shrieks by rocks and hills return, launched where the prairies wide and across the lakes to the free skies, unpent and glad and strong. From that point forward, the railroad appeared more frequently and in more dominant roles in art of every form. Now we'd be here all night if we got into piano, into music and movies. So let's stick with paintings. With the rise of modernism in the early 20th century, the conflict of technology and nature faded in artistic dialogue. The city replaced the wilderness as the central theme occupying the national imagination. Modernist painters used railroad imagery to portray the progressive vitality of the modern world with images of trains evoking the notions of speed and power. 
American George Lux painted roundhouses at High Bridge in 1910, which, to quote Ian Kennedy again, he depicted an everyday occurrence in a nondescript location and found in it unexpected grandeur. As foreshadowed by George Ennis more than half a century earlier, industrial capitalism is shown here as the national religion, and the smoking roundhouse has replaced St. Peter's as the basilica of the new world. And yet some artists raise questions about these changes. Thomas Hart Benton, a regionalist painter who came from the modernist school, celebrated rural American life in much of his work. Trains were frequent subjects, and at least two of his paintings present concerns over safety. This one, The Engineer's Dream from 1931, shows a nightmare or a premonition. At lower right, an engineer sleeps, fully dressed for duty with his railroad lantern and alarm clock beside him. He dreams of a wreck where his speeding train cannot stop in time to avoid a washed out bridge. We see him attempting to jump to safety, but his chances for survival do not look good. At right, the signalman's red flag is wholly inadequate against the powerful locomotive, perhaps a commentary on safety systems of the day, or even a broader statement about humanity in the face of onrushing technology. Ultimately though, the modernists embrace technology and for the steam locomotive, the most significant modernist painting is this one, Charles Scheeler's 1939 masterpiece, Rolling Power. It is a close-up, precisionist study of the wheels, rods, and valve gear of a New York Central Hudson locomotive of 20th century limited fame. While the locomotive features streamlining by noted industrial designer Henry Dreyfus, Scheele chose to focus on the least streamlined, most raw mechanical elements. More recent photographs have made views like this a cliche in railroad imagery, but rolling power was nothing short of groundbreaking in its day. It has been hailed as a radical departure from previous artistic representations of trains for the way it redefines beauty in the image of a functional object. Now we've been watching artists for more than a hundred years grapple with what the steam railroad meant. It's almost ironic to me then that in 1939, on the eve of its replacement by diesels, the steam locomotive finally transcended the societal questions surrounding it, freed from context as a thing of beauty unto itself. The steam locomotive was the single most compelling icon of the railroad. I don't need to tell you that. After diesels replaced steam, artistic representations of the railroad changed greatly. And after our next artist, the critical commentary also begins to run dry. The academic community has yet to take on a major consideration of railroads and art in the past 60 years, but I think there's still plenty for us to see. One of the most famous American artists to approach railroads was Edward Hopper. He painted them, Ian Kennedy pointed out, because they were part and parcel with his experience of American life. He also painted them with enough frequency that they must have held some special meaning to him. Yet despite growing up in the age of steam, Hopper focused on railroad subjects other than locomotives. One consistent theme throughout almost all of Hopper's work is the loneliness and alienation he felt was an ever greater part of American life. I'm sure we can all relate to that right now. You certainly see it here, with a railroad signal tower standing alone and empty against the twilight sky. Here's one more example from Hopper called Chair Car. It comes from late in his career in 1965, just two years before he died, and it depicts the interior view of a passenger train. Again, the themes of loneliness and alienation are strong, this time reinforced by the presence of multiple but very isolated passengers. Alienation is a central theme of what some critics and scholars consider the greatest American novel of the 20th century, The Great Gatsby. It directly confronts what author F. Scott Fitzgerald considered to be the excesses of an, overtly, of an overly materialistic culture of the 1920s. Prophetically, perhaps, the automobile is the dominant and highly symbolic mode of transportation in the book. But there's a poignant passage about railroads at the end and a flashback scene for Nick Carraway the novel's narrator. In the book, it says, when we pulled out into the winter night and the real snow, our snow, began to stretch out beside us and twinkle against the windows, 
In the dim lights of small Wisconsin stations moved by. A sharp and wild brace came suddenly into the air. We drew in deep breaths of it as we walked back from dinner through the cold vestibules. Unutter unutterably aware of our identity with this country for one strange hour before melting indistinguishably into it again. And that's my Middle West, not the wheat or the prairies or the lost Swede towns, but the thrilling returning trains of my youth. Well, I said we'd be getting back to nostalgia, and here we are. And nostalgia is the dominant theme of most railroad paintings of the last 50 years which have seen the rise of a distinct genre of railroad art, whose hallmark is a literal style of scenes that no longer exist, with the steam locomotive often as the central figure. This one, by the talented and, and prolific Gil Bennett from 2008, shows the Milwaukee Road's Hiawatha passenger train steaming up the Minnesota side of the Mississippi River on its run from Chicago to the Twin Cities. Nick Carraway would, would have been on this route in The Great Gatsby. Gill presented at our annual conference last year. He lives in Utah and works almost entirely on commissions, taking his clients' fondest railroad memories, often from childhood, and rendering them on canvas or paper in oils or watercolors. Michael Flanagan, painting from his own memories, was perhaps the apex of this style. His work reimagines a steam era Baltimore and Ohio railroad that he barely knew, yet clearly longed for. Flanagan wrote and illustrated a novel called Stations, published by Pantheon in 1994 with a backing by none other than Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. Stations is a beautiful and evocative portrayal of Flanagan's longing for the steam railroads he saw as a child. His fictional narrative and photorealistic paintings of old imaginary photographs comprise, comprise a multi-layered exploration of human passion and obsession. You can find used copies today for just a few dollars you don't even have to be a train lover to appreciate this book. It's hard to pick a favorite among the many great recent railroad artists, but I think Ted Rose, who grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, would have to be part of that discussion. He ultimately settled in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where he found success in its, in its competitive art community with his watercolors, which are imbued with emotion through his mastery of color and form. Ted painted contemporary and, and historic scenes I don't think it's fair to say that nostalgia was the only driving force behind his work. I think as much as anything, he was motivated by a great fascination with the railroad environment of all eras. But nostalgia certainly played a role in some of his paintings, like this masterful scene of the Milwaukee as it appeared during his childhood. That's the city's 35th Street viaduct at top. Today, almost nothing below it remains. Now, while nostalgia is a great motivator of today's railroad artists, it is not the only factor. In 2013, the Center conducted a survey of current railroad artists in North America, which we published in our journal, Railroad Heritage. Peter Moss put us in touch with Roger Watt, a British artist who lives in Vancouver, British Columbia, where he makes these exquisitely detailed graphite drawings. This one might still rely on nostalgia, but it's a different take. Watt does not try to recreate the past, and he embraces the weeds that are slowly reclaiming the steam locomotive. He's also made some very contemporary rail-themed drawings, including Times Square from 2013, a study of a New York City subway station and a train in motion. Motion is a frequent theme in Adam Normandon's work, another contemporary artist, and a connection via Peter Moss. Adam lives in Los Angeles, and paints modern railroad subjects in acrylics with photorealistic precision. When we interviewed Adam for the journal, he had this to say about his fascination with freight cars. To me, they are objects that are made to be functional. They are not made to be beautiful. They are made to serve a purpose. It's only through use and time that they become beautiful or interesting, as they develop a patina, as graffiti and grime and rust and all of these components build up. It creates a very unique persona to each particular freight car. That, he says, is something that I identified with, something that I hope life is. But as we gather more experience in life, the more interesting it becomes, the more interesting we become. I really like that parallel. I do too. And that brings us to our last painting. I had never heard of Catherine Gibbs until her painting, Miles to Go Before I Sleep, 
won Best in Show at an art exhibition in 2016. We've since published an article about her railroad work, and there's a lot I like about it. First, I like that she's employing something other than a literal style. What I've shown you just now is, of course, barely the tip of the iceberg when it comes to literal railroad paintings. Many of them are absolutely stunning, but it's always exciting for me to see something different, at least when it's as well executed as this is. I'm especially drawn to the bold brush strokes and the vibrant colors in Catherine's work. And I like that she's tackling today's freight railroad, looking neither backwards nor forwards, but as it exists right now. The railroad, for all its utilitarianism, it's still an endlessly fascinating subject. I want to finish up with a whirlwind introduction to railroads and photography. And I can only scratch the surface with the time we have left, but the history and analysis of paintings provide some important context for what we've been trying to do as photographers. And now first I have to address the distinction we make at the center between photography and art. That always invites the question of what is art and what is not. I want to make clear that I believe some photography achieves the status of art. Uh, definitely not all of it, probably not most of it, but some of it certainly does. And a lot of photography that might not be considered art can still be very interesting and valuable. So by calling ourselves the Center for Railroad Photography and Art, we simply have more latitude of what to tackle when it comes to photography. The relationship between railroads and photography is eminently worthy of study. These are two technologies that grew up together. As we just saw, the first railroads emerged in the late 1820s, and the first commercially viable photographic process, the daguerreotype, was introduced in 1839. Railroads immediately became favorite photography subjects, and they still are, nearly 200 years later. Now, these early cameras were heavy, cumbersome, and slow, of course, much too slow to stop the action of a moving train, so early railroad photographs tend to show static, staged, or posed scenes. And due to the time, effort, and expense required for each exposure, they tend only to show something of great significance. Now, of course, in the 1840s and 50s, the arrival of a new locomotive in any small town in the country would have been an event of great significance. So hence this daguerreotype of the Tioga locomotive from about 1849 and now in the Smithsonian's collection. The first major American conflict witnessed by photography was the Civil War. And of course, that was also the first major American conflict for the railroad. This is the ruined roundhouse in Atlanta, Georgia, after General Sherman's troops had finished with it. George Barnard made this albumen print in 1866, and it resides now at the Library of Congress. And we like to think of photography as a truthful means of visual representation. It was a big part of its early appeal and while that notion goes a long way, it's always been a little bit problematic. Look closely at the sky just above the horizon line in this print. If it looks a little bit strange, it should. The distinctive attribute of Barnard's printing was that he superimposed clouds from a different shot into the sky. So while we can say with certainty that the locomotives, roundhouse, and other buildings were in Atlanta, we have no idea where those clouds came from. Today, many people worry a great deal about the authenticity of digital photography, and programs like Photoshop certainly make this sort of manipulation easier, but it's nothing new. It's nearly as old as photography itself. Applications for photography quickly moved beyond pure documentation. Railroad companies began their existence on paper. To take physical form, they need capital. As railroad construction expanded westward during the 19th century, the proposed routes were located ever farther from the banks, lenders, and investors who were funding their construction. Photography provided a wonderfully convenient means of showing distant investors the progress and the promise of these railroad projects. Many railroads employed photographers to produce images that would both attract investors and keep them excited about these projects, which often took years to complete. And of course, none of these were more famous than the first transcontinental route with the Union Pacific building west from Nebraska and the Central Pacific building east from California to meet at Promontory Summit, Utah on May 10th, 1869. The UP employed A.J. Russell to photograph its construction while the CP utilized Alfred Hart. These were photographs made for the moment, solely for corporate purposes, to mollify investors and encourage would-be travelers and settlers. 
Yet they've become a tremendous historic record, the first large-scale photographic documentation project of what was then one of the largest construction projects ever undertaken in human history. And we still have these images more than 150 years later. And as these early railroads were completed, they of course needed to attract business. And much like attracting investors, photography was a powerful tool. In an arc that is the opposite of what we saw in art, photographers who had initially focused on locomotives and infrastructure pulled back to emphasize the scenery and an appeal to would-be travelers. William Henry Jackson was born in New York and went west on the Union Pacific in 1866, traveling to the end of the line to seek his fortunes. He became a successful photographer who did work for railroads all over the west as well as back east. This view from Colorado is an example of a photochrome, an early color, pro uh, color process. Now, while Jackson and many of his contemporaries did their work with enormous cameras, technological innovation was already changing photography. Consider this photograph taken around 1880 from the collection of another of the center's board members, Jeff Browse. At a glance, it might look similar to the daguerreotype of the Tioga from a few slides ago, but there are some notable differences. 30 years have passed. The Tioga was the state of the art when it was photographed in 1849. And this is a workaday switch engine. There's nothing special about it. And that's exactly what's special about this image. The development of smaller and cheaper cameras and, simple, and simpler chemical processes were making photography more convenient and more accessible, enabling much broader consideration of the railroad environment. And that's ultimately an extension of the art dialogue that we saw with the 19th century paintings. Now, to be sure, railroad companies have continued to hire professional photographers for both documentation and promotion. This is the first image I'm showing from the center's archive, a glass plate from our Jim Shaughnessy collection that's among our oldest material. It showcases the Rutland Railroad's substantial facilities in its namesake Vermont City around 1895. And check out the domed roundhouse in the back at left, and note the wispy steam from the locomotives evidence of an exposure time of at least several seconds. This is an example of the then new dry plate negative, the significant improvement in terms of ease and convenience over the wet plate processes that preceded it, but it still required a tripod and subjects at rest. But that was also beginning to change. Here's another example from Jeff Browse's collection taken in the late 1800s at Sturaka Viaduct, the same location as the Jasper Francis Cropsey painting. Here we see two Erie Railroad Camelback locomotives passing overhead, and they were clearly moving when they were photographed. They're not perfectly sharp. This camera wasn't able to completely freeze them, but it came close. Within a few years, cameras were fast enough to stop the motion of moving trains and no longer require tripods. That helped lead to this watershed image, The Hand of Man by Alfred Stieglitz. Just as railroads had not been considered appropriate art subjects a few decades earlier, debates raged over whether photography, with its reliance on mechanical devices and chemical processes, could be considered art. Now, Stieglitz was a passionate champion of photography. He ran a gallery in New York City and edited two leading photography journals. The Hand of Man, this photograph, shows a train in the yards of Long Island City in 1902 likely taken from the rear platform of, of another train. Today, this print is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Their website has this to say about it. Stieglitz showed that a gritty urban landscape could have an atmospheric beauty and a symbolic value as potent as those of an unspoiled natural landscape. The title alludes to this modern transformation of the landscape and also perhaps to photography itself as a mechanical process. Stieglitz believed that a mechanical instrument such as the camera could be transformed into a tool for creating art when guided by the hand and sensibility of an artist. So just as the railroad helped bring industrial and common subjects into the purview of fine art, so it helped elevate photography into the realm of art. Photography democratized image making. Eastman Kodak brought photography to the masses with its first Brownie camera in 1900. Cameras continued to become more affordable and to offer better quality, and photography became a popular hobby. Of course, railroad, took, railroad enthusiasts took their cameras trackside. Many of them began making portraits of locomotives that are similar in style to the daguerreotypes of the 1840s. 
These engine pictures became as collectible and tradable as baseball cards. This one comes from the center's Donald Furler collection. And Furler used an 8x10 view camera to achieve prints with maximum detail and clarity. Furler was also part of the small group of railroad photographers who sought to create the new, a new aesthetic, recognizing that locomotives were built to run and taking advantage of ever improving camera technology. They pioneered the action shot to capture the drama of locomotives as well as their mechanical details. World War II brought record-breaking traffic to the nation's railroads. These employees often worked 12 or even 16 hour days, six or seven days a week to keep the trains moving during the war. As part of a nationwide documentary project, the federal government's Office of War Information assigned Jack Delano to photograph the nation's railroads based out of Chicago and paying particular attention to the railroad workers. Delano used one technology, photography, to put a human face on another technology, the railroad. He was also a pioneer user of Kodachrome, the first commercially viable color film, which Kodak introduced in 1935. His photographs are now at the Library of Congress. And the center used them to create an exhibition with the, with the Chicago History Museum, which we called Railroaders, Jack Delano's Homefront Photography. We spent several years tracking down the descendants of Delano's portrait subjects and interviewing them to write biographies about the people in the photographs. Together, the stories and the photographs tell the story of Chicago's and the nation's railroad community during the war. The exhibit was on display for almost two years where it drew cl close to half a million visitors. Oops. Now, World War II was the last great stand for the steam locomotive. We've already talked about what that, what their demise meant to railroad art. Now, many photographers like Donald Furler, who focused almost exclusively on steam locomotives, all but stopped shooting once they were gone. First though, these photographers had a decade long race to capture steam before it ended. Of course, none more famously than O. Winston Link, the New York City commercial photographer who devoted five years and $150,000 of his own money 1950s dollars to photograph the last great steam railroad in North America, the coal hauling Norfolk and Western in Appalachia. This photograph of a train passing the drive-in theater at Yeager, West Virginia, is so famous that it was spoofed on an episode of The Simpsons. Now, Link preferred to work at night so he could fully control the lighting. He used these elaborate synchronized flash setups with dozens of bulbs and miles of wire. Rather than focusing on the locomotives, he focused on his vision of the lifestyle they hoped to create and of which they had become an indelible part. David Plowden also photographed the end of the steam locomotives, and he then moved beyond railroads to photograph all aspects of the landscape and the built environment, becoming one of the most significant photographers in the United States. And he still continued to photograph railroads, not so much the trains, but the railroads themselves and their imprints on the landscape. That was an important notion in the contemporary photography we featured in After Promontory, the center's project to mark the sesquicentennial of the first transcontinental railroad last year. Rather than focusing on its construction, we explored its legacy from the other transcontinental routes that followed to their status and significance today. Some of them still carry Whitman's pulse of the continent, others lie silent. While their rails might be gone, their scars remain. And sometimes these scars are too big to tear down. These are a few of the coaling towers that once fueled steam locomotives. Many of them still stand today. And Jeff Browse, our board member, made a quest of photographing them all in a straightforward documentary style that he presents in grids or typologies, which lend themselves especially well to these industrial subjects. Other railroad photographers explore the relationships between the past and present through re-photography. Another of our members, Steve Vandenberg, who lives in Nevada, photographed the steam-powered narrow-gauge railroad in California's Owens Valley in the 1950s. He returned in the early 2000s, long after the railroad had been abandoned, and lined up his compositions to perfectly match his photographs from half a century earlier. And I'll go back and just look at the mountains on the horizon and see what little remains of the SP's once narrow-gauge lines. 
Still other railroad photographers have fully embraced the drama of modern diesel railroading. One of the best was Jim Shaughnessy of Troy, New York, whose collection of nearly 90,000 photographs now resides in the center's archive. And of course, the ever improving camera and film technology have continued to open up new opportunities. Faster color film made color action shots possible, like this one from our Victor Hand collection, taken on the Rio Grande's Tanglefoot Curve in the fall of 1967. A smaller, more discreet cameras made it easier to employ a photojournalistic style around railroads. This view comes from another of our collections, that of Wallace W. Abbey, which I'll be speaking about next week. And it shows passengers in a trainman with the California Zephyr, right in Denver in February of 1953. Faster cameras and films have even allowed for night action photography. This is a photograph by the center's founder, John Gruber, showing the Chicago and Northwestern Depot in Madison, Wisconsin. It offers strong proof that the diesel railroad still has plenty of drama. John passed away in 2018, and his family donated his photography collection to the center earlier this year. With more than 100,000 images, it is our largest collection. We have just begun processing it. We look forward to finding many more gems within it. And of course, the rise of digital imaging in this century has further revolutionized railroad photography. The digital workflow takes all of the creative tools of the black and white darkroom and puts them at the literal fingertips of the color photographer while offering low light capabilities that our predecessors could have only dreamed of. This is my photograph taken this fall at the mouth of the Wisconsin River, lit by the reflection of the full moon. Now, ultimately, we face a technological paradox in railroad photography. On the one hand, innovation leads to ever expanding photographic capabilities. Last year, for $400, I purchased a drone with a 12 megapixel digital camera that opens up a new world of aerial perspectives. And then on the other hand, innovation diminishes the railroad's visual interest. Most trains today look about the same no matter where they are, while their infrastructure is more homogenous and sterile and nearly devoid of human life. Of course, most of it is also off limits on private property where trespassing laws have been far more strictly enforced after 9-11. And yet like the painters who find inspiration in contemporary railroading, as photographers, we continue to pursue the railroad with the kind of passion bordering on obsession that Michael Flanagan explored in his book, Stations. This is my friend Elrin Lawrence in Peterson, Utah last spring. Maybe some of you were there too for the 4014. The marriage of railroads and photography is as strong as ever and their progeny is often spectacular. This photograph taken by Eric Williams and showing the Chicago L won first prize in the center's 2014 awards program. It's a wonderful example of using today's technology to create an interesting image of an everyday scene. And that carries on the long tradition of railroads and art. Thank you. I'd be happy to chat with anyone or take questions with anyone who's interested. Thanks again for your time tonight. All right, everyone. Um, I'm sure some of you have questions for Scott. Let me get the uh, control of this back. Um, hmm. There we go. Um, so I would ask that for those of you who have questions, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourselves. I'd ask that you unmute, ask your question, and then go back on mute when you're done, please. Uh, excellent presentation. You really covered the spectrum. I appreciate your time and attention. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. This is, um, I've been in communication actually with your center about, um, donating my slide collection. Um, I wouldn't elevate some of it to art, but it's documentary and it's from the early 70s through the mid 80s. I've given them the information they want. I mean, I'm not, um, I'm not gonna give it away right, right away, but my, my question is um, the way it's documented, you're asking for some information about how it's documented. Um, Basically, I wrote 
you know, on the slides themselves, times, dates, places. Uh, there's no other, is that going to be adequate? Yeah, no, it's, uh, and really we're just kind of curious as to, as to how. I mean, in some cases there's no information at all and uh, that, that presents its own challenges. So you know, any, any, uh, any documentation or information is, is um, certainly better than nothing. And, and we, we see it in, in all, 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 uh, all over the spectrum. And they are sorted, you know, by the times and the places where they were taken, that sort of thing. So great, great. Are you in touch with Adrian about that? I believe that's the woman I've been. Yeah, she's the archivist. That's right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No. Very good. Actually, I have a, another question on the on black and white. Um, yes. I do have some negatives as well but they're not i mean they're not um and i do have some prints that i made when i had access to a dark room um is the center interested in that material as well oh absolutely you know i mean we're um we we um you know we're trying to build a representative archive that you know can kind of you know, cover all all types of photography all styles all eras you know it's not it's not our goal to be comprehensive. You know, the, the historical societies have, have you know, phenomenal uh, collections that, you know, can allow you to explore entire locomotive rosters or divisions. Um, you know, we're trying to build something that's a little bit more representative of the different styles of railroad photography from, from all over the country and even all over the world. Thanks, very good presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, that was wonderful. I'm not sure that I'm clear, are you, do you own most of this collection in the museum um, or is there, there isn't really a facility right now even to visit, right? No, um, uh, and I, I, so I showed only a few photographs from our collections. Um, you know, most of the paintings are at art museums all over the, the world. Um, the majority of them are old enough that they're actually the, the intellectual property at least is, is in the public domain. So you can get right onto Wikipedia and other sites and download beautiful high res. Um, yeah copies of some of these images. In fact, the Straka Viaduct, I downloaded a probably a 20 or 30 megapixel uh, image off of Wikipedia and made a, made a full-size print for my office wall. I like that painting so much. Um, the original for that was in the Toledo Museum of Art. Um, and some, the, uh, well, the, I mean, it's easy to find the data about these. Um, but we do have a pretty sizable collection of photography primarily at the center. We do have some paintings. We have a number of Ted Rose's original watercolors and a few others as well. And, um, you know, but, but so many paintings were done on commission or, you know, for other places that already have given them good homes. Um, and, you know, we've really kind of focused on, on photography and, and particularly the, the, the photography that comes from, you know, the, from, from us, you know, these, these dedicated really passionate amateurs who, who document the railway and, and often do it far more thoroughly than, than um, corporate, uh, the corporations would have commissioned. You know, I sure. mean, the railroads only wanted people to go out and photograph the brand new locomotives, or the brand new crane elevators or whatever was, was new and exciting and profitable. And, you know, as, as enthusiasts, we go out and photograph everything because it's there and, and that provides a far greater picture of, of the history and, and, and its impacts. Um, and so we've really focused our efforts on um, you know, building up an archive uh, of, of that photography. We have, uh, we don't have a, a gallery where we display it in Madison. We do have an archival facility of where we store it. Uh, you know, the storage is, is quite, you know, important for longevity of photographs. Um, we've seen some of our, our early black and white um, photographs before they came to us have suffered degradation. Um, cellulose acetate film uh, is especially a notorious, uh, you can often smell kind of a vinegary scent coming off of the older ones. And that's the uh, characteristic of, of the acetic acid that actually forms within the, the substrate layers of the film. And it will, as it starts to form over time, it will actually start to form these little bubbles that, that pop up in between the film layers. And as these get bigger, they want to attach to one another. And so you'll get these, these channels that form uh, and then you'll get cracking and eventually these pages turn to dust. Um, and, you know, that's nitrates, of course, are, fa are famous for catching on fire if they're, they're stored in, the, in, the, in hot enough conditions. Um, and so, you know, storing things at, at the lowest temperatures possible and, and low humidity is, is really important to the longevity. So we have a, a climate control facility uh, where we're able to, to maintain the temperature in the low 60s and, and the humidity in the, the 30 to 40 percent range throughout the year, which really helps the longevity of these materials. Um, but it's only a you know only our, our archival staff has regular access to that. 
um, in non-COVID times, we're open to the public. Uh, we have you know facilities where people can come in, and if you request uh, images in advance, our staff can get them out and, and have them for people to look at. Um, but because we digitize so much, we're able to share images with people all over the world, regardless of whether you're able to come into our offices or not. Um, we have a good number of our photographs posted on our website, as well as on our Flickr page. We're adding more to both of those regularly. And we, we also try to create finding aids for all of our collections that kind of highlight the, the specific uh, locations, um, railroads covered, any other notable subject matter, eras, that kind of thing. So you can at least have a starting point and, and know what might be in them. So if you have specific uh, research interests, um, you know, be in touch with our archival staff and, and they can get you, uh, you know, kind of in the direction you need to go. Um, you know, we're, the other challenge we have is, you know, we're kind of victims of our success right now is uh, our collection. <laughs> I've been growing. Uh, we've been getting more image requests, more people interested in donating. These are all, you know, wonderful problems to have, and we're trying to, to build up our capacity uh, to, add, to add more archival staff, more storage facilities, and you know, probably some some tighter collecting policies in the future that, you know, hopefully will allow us to continue to be as representative as possible. But you know, to the extent that we can manage our growth in such a way that we can continue to to maintain these collections both now and for for as many years down the road as we can. What do you do for archiving digital? So that's a great question. And uh, if you actually say, quote, archiving digital, we don't uh, right now. Um, while we digitize everything, we treat those digital images as surrogates. Uh, so they're copies of our originals that are created strictly for, for ease of use or access. Uh, we're not considering those digital copies to be uh, the archival copy of, of any of our, our photographs. Um, that's kind of a strategic decision on our point for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, number one, the, the greatest need in our community right now is for, you know, the, the film-based photography collections, and particularly those from the, the late steam era, um, photographers who, uh, who have either passed away already or, you know, who frankly won't be around for that much longer. Uh, and so, you know, we're really trying to focus on, on those, like, like those, those great masters of that era, like the Jim Shaughnessy's of the world. And, John Gruber's and uh, to pull in those collections and, and make sure that they have safe homes for all time. Um, you know, but of course the, the day is coming when, you know, digital photography will be the only photography out there for, for archival purposes or anything else. Uh, and so one of the things we're doing right now is, is while we're continuing to work, you know, pretty strategically on, on building up our, our film-based archives and, and making digital access copies of those, we're also trying to build up our technological resources so that we'll be in a position to start doing, you know, actual archiving of, of digital images uh, and you know the the challenges that come with that are, are you know, the greater technological challenges of, of having systems that we feel are sufficiently robust in you know in place that we can say with some certainty that these digital files are going to last you know just as long as that code of slide that you stick in the in the in you know in the cold storage and you can pull it out 100 years later and it'll be just as bright and sharp as it was the day you got it back from from processing um, and, you know, we've seen digital files that have gone corrupt in years. Uh, if any of you tried to store photographs on, on CD-ROMs in the early days? Uh, I mean, I have, I have CDs that are a few years old that you can't read anymore. Um, you know, magnetic card drives are, are far better. Uh, flash storage is probably better still, but still pretty expensive for, for the size that we need. So the technology is catching up, but it's, you know, it's still, it still has some work to do. And, and we have work to do on our end to, to build up the capacity and the resources to be able to take on, um, you know, digital archival images. Um, so that's, that's someplace that we, that we plan to get to, um, you know, but in, in terms of, uh, of what we're committed to, we're, we're not there yet, but it is definitely where we're trying to go. Scott, are you doing anything with motion pictures of any type? A little bit. Um, we don't have. We, we have not been specifically collecting film, um, but we we have taken on uh, some eight and sixteen millimeter film rolls that have come with some of the still photography collections we've acquired. Um, you know, the the biggest challenge there is digitization. Uh, we currently don't have resources in house to to digitize uh, moving picture film right now. Um, that's stuff that we have to outsource. So I'm sure if any of you have looked into it, you know how expensive and time consuming that can be. Uh, so, you know, again, it's, it's all sort of part and parcel as we're trying to build up our capacity. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly been a lot of, uh, of great uh, moving image film shot on railroads. One of the very first commercial films of all time was uh, a short film of a train arriving at a station in France done by 
uh, the Lumiere brothers who did a lot of, uh, of short silent films in, the, in those early days of film. So there's you know, this incredible history of railroads and, and, and cinema. Um, but you know, it's, it's not something that we're doing a lot of right now. But again, that's, that's something that we'd like to be able to add capacity to do more of in the future. Scott, we had one question come in on the, on the YouTube uh, chat stream. Uh, Dennis Lisey asked, what do you see for the future uh, in railroad art and photography? I mean, clearly it's got a long history and style has changed. Where do you see it going from here? Well, first of all, hi, Dennis, and thanks for tuning in tonight. Um, and it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I showed a photograph from our Transcontinental Project by Drake Hokinson. Uh, Drake's a member and a good friend. Uh, he contributed a lot of images and, and some great writing to the Transcontinental Project. Uh, he does all of his photography for that project, at least on, on large format film-based cameras, um, kind of as an homage to some of those early photographers who were doing, you know, A.J. Russells and Alfred Hartz who were shooting the Transcontinental back in the, in the 19th century. Excuse me. Um, and Drake had a great comment as we were talking about kind of the Transcontinental Project and its legacy and, and its legacy in photography and uh, current approaches to photography about it. And what Drake said is, um, what's hard about photography now is that it's so easy. <laughs> and he is absolutely right about that. You know, we see that in terms of the preservation challenges we face. You know, I mean, I'm I'm as guilty as everyone. I started out shooting color slides and, you know, you'd get a roll or two and go out for a weekend and you try to make every single frame count. You know, now I have a digital camera that can hold thousands of images on a single memory card. I don't even think about whether I need to take a shot or not. If, it, if the thought occurs to me, I shoot it. And, you know, I say to myself, <laughs> I'll figure that out later and edit it, you know, when I get home and sort it when I get home. And, you know, that's not my favorite thing to do. When I get home, I'd rather put together presentations or write articles and go out and take more pictures. And then what do we do with them? Um, so there, there's simply the challenges of, of the curation of, of this, you know, these vast quantities of, of images we're creating. Um, you know, and, and then there's that technological arc of, uh, of the, the, the camera technology getting better. While of course, you know, we see so much of, of what we love about Robert's visual environment, uh, you know, continues to deteriorate and, you know, be replaced by more sterile and more modern facilities. So, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of interesting things happening right there. Um, I'm not in the business of making predictions. I, I will say just based on the incredible, incredible work that, that we see every day. I mean, if, if you're on, on YouTube or on Rail Pictures or on Flickr or on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or who knows what the new social media platforms that the young shooters are using today are, the, the work they post is, is incredible and jaw-dropping and, and awe-inspiring. And then simultaneously to this, there are there are some really talented photographers who are continuing to work in, you know, the large format film based photography doing very thoughtful, uh, you know, very um, deeply artistically rooted documentary projects that are, are very artful, um, that are, are kind of referencing that photographic history and, and using those traditional technologies today uh, to make absolutely gorgeous images uh, uh, that are you know, really deeply imbued with meaning, kind of a, a lot of them work in these traditions of, of exploring the, the remains of, of railroads that have been abandoned or are no longer in use. And so there's, there's all sorts of fascinating photographic activity happening right now. And I have great faith in everyone who, who pursues these projects in just the ongoing interest of railroads that we will continue to find interesting ways to to document and showcase railroads. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that we'd be here all night if we got into music, and I'm, I'm a, a, certainly a lover of folk music, by no means a scholar of it, but, you know, I go to folk festivals in Wisconsin that are, are filled with 20 and 30 somethings, and these bands on stage that are, again, these 20 and 30 somethings are singing about steam locomotives. And I mean, the, 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 the imagery is just as powerful in, in modern contemporary folk music as it was in some of, you know, the, the, uh, the good old traditional bluegrass songs. So it's, it's pervasive. Um, people love trains, people love to ride trains, uh, people love to document and photograph and, and react artistically to trains. So I think the the future is incredibly bright, and, and we will certainly do our best to showcase uh, whatever comes our way at the center. Awesome. I had uh, a couple quick things. Um, one was um, 
my local favorite railroad artist um, he actually painted about five miles from where I'm at. And um, that's Otto Cooler. Oh, sure. His, uh, his work. And then uh, also, I wondered about if uh, anybody has tried to do, uh, you had the one now and then photo. Um, I was thought, boy, wouldn't it be great to go see some of those 1850, 60 paintings and do now, now and then photo with those? Yeah, that's that's a great point. I actually I shared the the, the Jasper Francis Cropsey painting of Straka Viaduct uh, on my Facebook page to, to let people know about tonight's event. And mm -hmm. uh, one of my friends there, a guy named Mike Tisdale out in California, asked um, just kind of how true to, to real life the perspective is and, and whether you could still get that view today. And yeah. I've only been to Straka Viaduct once. That was in 2009. Um, and from what I can see, the perspective is very true to life. Even even the, the second smaller viaduct off to the right is, is there. Uh, everything about yeah. the scene the scene seems to resonate. But of course, it's completely overgrown with trees now. I mean, those those rocks are that the figures were posing on. Those are there, but everything's overgrown. Yeah. So yeah, you know, it, it would be almost impossible to to take a photograph that would be uh, recognizable at all. Um, mm -hmm. That said, the, one of the first British paintings I showed, the one with the, the, the pink um, arched viaduct off in the distance that came yeah. from a, a member of Peter Moss's collection, uh, he's visited that scene uh, within the last couple of years and taken a photograph of it, and it is almost identical. Um, the viaduct is you know, weathered after 150 years of use, and now it has overhead electric catenary for the, for the electric wires, um, but the scene is, is largely unchanged. So, it's that that would be an interesting project we can know I, I think probably for every one of those paintings that you could line up uh, and do a contemporary photograph that would be recognizable there's probably 10 or maybe even 100 that the view would be totally unrecognizable and even impossible to obtain today but it would be interesting yeah. to try great oh and then did you say you did have some auto cooler uh, we don't, I don't think we have any in our collections. We certainly featured his work in the past. Um, I know he's, uh, at least one of his uh, has been on a cover of our journal Railroad Heritage uh, from, from several years ago. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, but yeah, he, he's certainly done some, some fantastic work. Yeah, okay. Thanks. No, thank and you. Yes, fantastic presentation, thank, thank you. you. Any other questions? Uh, that was wonderful. I almost want to say stupendous. That was just wonderful. The, uh, the history forward, and, and uh, um, I'm, I'm uh, very grateful that uh, Dave got you talked into spending an hour with us. That was fabulous. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Thanks for uh, thanks for tuning in and, and sticking around for the whole thing. I sure appreciate it. Hey, Scott, I was going to mention uh, uh, that. Uh, let us know about your uh, magazines there. How many times a year do they come out? Oh, we're a quarterly. Uh, so we, we've, and uh, typically the, the new issues come out in, in March, June, September, and December. Uh, we just published our, our winter issue uh, with a, a Colorado photograph on the cover. Uh, in fact, um, Mark Hemphill, some of you probably know, did a, just an incredible uh, story about a photographer named Ralph Halleck who went out and shot Tennessee Pass in the dead of winter in the late 1940s and got these just utterly incredible views, mainly of uh, train number two going, going over the, the pass on a, on a number of different days. Uh, those are all uh, at the Colorado Railroad Museum now and we were able to, to work with their archivist and secure permission to publish, I think, seven of those photographs with Mark's uh, expert commentary about them in this issue of the magazine. Um, also included is a look at railroading in the Bay Area of uh, California in the 1970s, and then a lengthy article about railroad postcards um, and kind of an overview of the history of postcards uh, and, and just the incredible prevalence of railroad imagery in them. Uh, that's by one of our members, Ben Adler. Um, and uh, if you have any interest in postcards at all, I mean, this is, uh, you know, I, I, we're pretty proud of this article. It certainly, I think, is a great history of of uh, the railroad postcard. So those are the three main articles um, in, in this issue. You know, we try, we really strive for a mix of contemporary and historic photography, uh, as well as paintings and other forms of art. So, you know, from one issue to the next, we try to, to work in as many uh, different topics as we can. 
Um, we've got some some really fun things coming up. And for, for those of you who are interested in movies and films, um, one of our authors, uh, Justin Franz, who I'm sure is a familiar name, uh, Justin's a great journalist and is currently doing uh, some research for a story about kind of the history of, of railroad videos, um, you know, talking about some of the history of pin tracks and, um, you know, all the different railroad videos that have been produced and, and including kind of the current state of the art with so many um, of these great uh, YouTubers out there. So that'll be coming up, I think, in our summer issue uh, of 2021. And we sell single copies of every issue on our website. They're typically $8 each. Or if you want to join as a member, membership's $50 for the year. That includes all four issues of the journal, uh, as well as some uh, discounts to our events and other, other things going on. Uh, we'd certainly uh, welcome anyone who wants to join as a member and support our work. Membership supports everything we do, all of the archiving, all of the events, the exhibitions, everything else. It's all supported from the incredible generosity of our, our members. Um, and uh, we'd love to have all of you uh, sign on and, and be a part of that if, uh, if you so desire. So and that's all on our website, uh, railphoto-art.org. I've got my, my handy little... Uh, <laughs> that uh, works good. Yeah, you know, the analog and the digital combination. And if you want to find us on, on YouTube, you can, uh, you can do that right here. So, so uh, I'll try to get this zoomed properly by pulling them back and forth. So um, check us out on, on either of those. And as I mentioned, we will be doing a talk on Wallace Abbey's photography uh, a week from tomorrow night and you can sign up uh, on our website that's on the webex platform um, yeah webex before you will be done in advance it's free uh and it'll also be put on youtube after the fact uh, no, that's neat that you uh, offer those online now since we're all stuck at home i've i've been wanting for years to get to one of your annual uh conversation get-togethers uh and and i'm sure those will probably come back when when the time is right but uh we're, we're tentatively hoping we might be able to do one in the second half of next year. The spring one will definitely be online, um, and we'd certainly love for everyone to tune in for that. And, you know, we've, we've heard from so many people who were really appreciative of the fact that we've offered them online who haven't been able to attend, you know, like you, Dave. So uh, we definitely plan to continue to have online offerings even after we're back to whatever the new one might be. Yeah, and uh, we, we appreciate uh, everybody's patience. Uh, I know that... Uh, our meetings uh, for the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club are not quite as smooth as we would like, you know, and we don't have that personal touch, but uh, we don't have a lot of options right now. So hopefully this will suffice. Um, thanks for uh, spending your, your evening with us, Scott. And uh, we appreciate the, uh, the look and the background on stuff. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks again for having me. And, you know, I think uh, it's, one of the things that's been very encouraging right now is people have been very patient for all of the technological difficulties that we, we've uh, encountered. Um, you know, right. there's a lot of gratitude out there as well, and, and we, we really appreciate that. And certainly we're trying to do everything we can to, to provide events and, and other programming and, you know, chances for community and to connect like, like these events have become. You know, it's, uh, maybe it's not ideal, but it expands our reach and it still lets us connect and get together and talk. And that's, that's as important as ever right now. Yeah, we, we, we try to look at the bright side. It allows uh, people like our member, John Scott, there, uh, <laughs> who gets the long distance award every month. See, there he is, because he, he tunes in at tea time uh, from Australia and uh, gets to partake because typically he wouldn't get to come to our meetings. So I guess that's our that's our upside. Actually, it's 1.30 in the afternoon, a very convenient time for me. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I have enjoyed the presentation very much. It's a lot of research that you've done, and thank you for presenting it. Oh, my yeah. absolute pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I guess if no one has any more questions, uh, we'll wrap it up and let Scott go. He's a little bit different time zone than we are, not not as much as Australia. But, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to remind everybody that's involved, there is a board meeting next Monday, and I think Nathan will send out a connection on that. So. Yeah, and, yeah, I'll fire off an email as soon as we get done here. And again, Scott, thanks so much. Personally. Oh, yeah. Wow. My pleasure. Great. Well, thanks, thanks so much for having me and it's pleasure to pleasure to be part of your group here tonight. Yes, yeah, so we'll we'll probably love to invite you back another time. And and a reminder to everybody, uh next month for January we'll have uh Steve Berry will join us. He's uh editor of Railfan and Railroad Magazine with some uh steam from Pennsylvania. Um all right. Uh, good night, everyone. Be awesome and Merry Christmas to everyone.
Yeah. Well, Steve always gets great programs. You guys will be in for a treat. Happy New Year. Well, we'll see you before then. Yeah, to be careful, everyone, and, and Merry Christmas. Yep. Happy holidays to all. And thanks for your efforts, Nathan. Yeah. Sure. Night all. Yeah. Night thanks, all. everyone. Appreciate it.